Okay, so we're going to start up um, and we're going to talk today about post-processing photographs uh, and developing kind of a digital workflow. What are the typical adjustments that you need to make? And we have to start with the basics. But today is about getting our feet wet in Photoshop. Uh, if I had to predict, I would say if if we had to assign one of the most probable uh, Adobe products that you've worked in before, it's probably Photoshop. How many people have worked in Photoshop before? How many people feel comfortable in Photoshop? There's a few of you like kind of maybe a little bit, right? We're going to change that. But I would say Photoshop's probably the easiest to get used to and the easiest to work in, and therefore it's a good place to start. Um, you guys all went out on campus last class. Uh, and obviously the website's back up so that we're in good shape so you can see the stuff that you need to see today. And you shot a bunch of photographs. So today we're talking about, I have the photos, they're in my camera, what do I do with them now? Right? And the truth is that all too often, we don't do anything with them. But I'm going to try to teach you how to make those photos significantly better than they already are. Okay? So let's go through and let's talk about what is a digital workflow. So the term workflow refers to a set of steps that you typically repeat that deal with your, your photographs. And it's from capturing the image all the way to the final output. What is that final product that we're trying to create? The workflow is always going to vary by who the photographer is. So my workflow is going to be different than your workflow. It's going to be dependent on what your camera is and what your computer is. I work on a Mac. You might work on Windows. That's going to change things. So there's always differences in it. But generally speaking, there are certain steps that we're going to go through. I know that when I shoot, generally the major post-processing thing I always have to do to my images is a levels adjustment. And we're going to talk about what a levels adjustment is. Okay? But I've learned through years and years of shooting photos that that's something that's very typical for me that I have to do. You might not have to do that. You might have to do something else. Right? But that's a standard step in my photo workflow. So when we start to talk about what are the key components in a digital workflow, the workflow obviously begins by going out and capturing the images. You have to have images to start the workflow, otherwise whatever we're talking about is a moot point. right? So we have to start by going out and capturing those images. The next step is getting those images from your camera onto the computer somehow. Okay, So if you shot them on your phone, maybe it's emailing to yourself. Maybe it's syncing via you know, the iCloud photo library. Maybe it's plugging it in, plugging it in, putting the ca card into the, the uh, computer. It's a variety of different ways, but you have to get them off your camera and into the computer in some uh, package. The other thing about it is you may elect to use some kind of a photo management application. Right, that deals with how do you store and manage your photos. There are a variety of them out there. Some of you may already be using them. Certainly, if you're on a Mac or you're in the Apple ecosystem, you're probably using the Photos app that comes with your Mac. Um, so that's certainly a way of managing it. Uh, Windows 10, I believe, now comes with a basic photo management application. I don't have too much experience with it. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but you could be using something uh, like Lightroom, which is kind of the, the high end. Um, professional version uh, built by Adobe, the same people who make Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator. Lightroom is their photo management app. Um, Apple used to have a program called Aperture. It broke my heart two years ago when Apple said, we're not doing it anymore. Right? I really liked it. I had invested a lot of time in it, and they cut it out from under me. Anyway, next you're going to do some series of post-processing steps. And those post-processing steps are for corrections of errors. Right? Maybe you want to retouch some things. You want to make things look a little bit better. Maybe it's a levels adjustment. Maybe you want to make an image into black and white. Maybe you want to adjust the cropping. You didn't quite get the rule of thirds right. You want to adjust it a little bit. That's something that you might do. So these are post-process things that you do to make your images better than they are straight out of the camera. Okay? And then finally, you're going to output your photos. Maybe you send them to Costco and have them printed. Maybe you post them online. Maybe you put them on your own website. Maybe they go onto Instagram. I don't know, right? But they go somewhere, typically. Or maybe they sit there for some later use. I don't know. So they show up in your time hop feed. I don't know, right? The question is, do you already have a workflow? Chances are you probably do, right? The glaring hole that's typically in it is the post-processing part of the workflow. Generally, um, I would say most of you have a workflow that involves taking the picture and posting it to Instagram. <laughs> Right? End of workflow. Right? We're going to try to insert the post-processing in there. Okay? 
If you know what your typical post-processing steps are, it's much easier to do it because you know that's immediately that's the thing I'm going to do, right? You're going to do that at levels adjustment, OK? Is there any steps you can automate? Sometimes you can automate certain things that you do typically. Um, the best like pro photographers, a wedding photographer or something, they have a very sophisticated workflow. And there are certain things that they do that are completely automated. Click a button, it just does it, right? Because they know that's the look that they want, OK? And then you want to think about how your photos are going to be used long term. So when we start thinking about software, obviously in this class, we're going to focus on Photoshop. And that's the point. We need to focus on Photoshop because you need to learn Photoshop. But there are other applications that are out there that if you don't want to pay for Photoshop, you could use to process your images. And a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about, the levels adjustment, the curves, they're available through a variety of free applications. So you don't really need Photoshop. But at the same time, if you understand the techniques, you can apply it. Okay? So, you have to obviously understand if your computer is a Windows machine or it's a Mac machine, because there's different software out there for each uh, platform. Right? Is it your personal computer, or is it, are you in here in the lab? What are, the, what are the options that are available here versus your own computer? Maybe it's online. The next piece that's really important to, to think about is non-destructive editing. And so what I mean by non-destructive editing is that the things that are done to the image are applied in layers that can be turned off or reversed without having to undo and go back through a series of steps. So if, for example, I had my original image and I performed an operation and I turned it to black and white, okay? if it's a destructive editor, that image is now black and white, and there's no way for me to undo it back to being a color image. It's permanently black and white. A non-destructive editor, which is something like Photoshop, allows me to uncheck the layer or turn off the layer and take it from the black and white image back to the color image. Or I don't really like the curves adjustment, let me turn it off. Right? All of the things are applied as layers. So they're reversible independent of one another as steps. So that's really important okay? because destructive obviously is a bad thing. We don't want to lose the, the data if we wanted something. Generally speaking, the free options out there are great from 0 to about 10,000 images. They do really well. If you bump up 10,000 plus images, you might need to start thinking about professional options or certainly paid options or paid storage or whatever, because you're starting to get big, big library, a lot of images to work in. So let's talk about some of the options that are out there. Uh, this is probably going to go away before too long. Uh, Google has a product called Picasa. They're kind of pushing it in the direction of an online editor so that they're not going to have this desktop standalone. This semester will probably be the last semester that I introduce it as a, as a software option, uh, because everything's going to the in the cloud based thing. Uh, so it's here. I wouldn't recommend downloading it and getting used to it, because we're kind of on its way out. Okay? Um, so just something to be aware of. But it is, it is a, a decent product, or it was a decent product, because it has some uh, built-in backup tools. It worked nicely as an organization tool. But again, we're moving toward the cloud, so I think it's a little bit less important. So Photoshop has something called their Express service or their Express editor. And if you buy into the Adobe ecosystem, this is something that you can work with as well. It has an iPad app uh, that you can work with. And it's essentially kind of an online photo management application. Uh, it allows you to do some basic editing. It's not as good as a desktop application. But a lot of the stuff is built in. Uh, there is a free account that you can use. Um, the thing to be aware of is that this can be a destructive editor. And they're working in the direction of making it a non-destructive editor so that you can reverse steps. I don't know where they currently are in that process. So you have to be a little careful when you get to these online editors. There's another company called Pixlr.com. And again, this is a destructive editor. But if you look at the Pixlr interface, it's essentially Photoshop just online. Right? This looks exactly like Photoshop. The layers look the same. The history looks the same. It's, a, it's essentially a Photoshop clone. Um, you have to be a little bit aware, again, that it can be destructive editing. Um, so just make a copy of the file before you upload it, and you're fine. You can always go back to the original. Uh, but it's pretty good. A lot of good features. Um, the way I refer to it is shockingly Photoshop-like. <laughs> right? I'm wondering why they haven't been sued over it yet. Uh, but it's very close. Um, you could save the, the processed image back to your flash drive. And then it's a new original image. Um, so something to be aware of. 
It does require an internet connection, so it's not like you're going to be off in the middle of the boonies editing your photos. I don't know why you would be anyway, but if you were, you'd have problems because you'd need an internet connection. Um, fairly advanced editing features, um, though no adjustment layers, and that's one of the big things that Photoshop itself allows us to do. And if you're asking what an adjustment layer is, don't worry, you're going to learn that today. Uh, photos is the Mac and iOS ecosystem thing. A lot of you probably have iPhones, therefore you probably use Photos in some capacity. It works great if you're in the whole Apple ecosystem. So you have a Mac, you have your iPad, and you have your iPhone, and they all sync, and life is great. Okay? If you have a Windows machine, it doesn't quite work so well. Okay? But it's certainly something to be aware of. All the advanced editing features are there. Uh, the digital storage and management, the backup to iCloud, all that stuff is built in, which is great. It is non-destructive editing of images. Uh, I do say that it's free on any Mac. That is true up to a certain point. So if you use the iCloud library, at some point you're going to run out of space and have to start paying for it. Okay, that's how Apple works. You get a free account, I think it's like five gigs or something, and then you have to start paying. And I think the next tier is like a dollar a month and you get you know, 100 gigs or, or $2 and you get 500 gigs. I don't remember, but it's something like that. But the point is, at some point, you're going to run out of space and have to start paying. Okay? It does have advanced editing features like histograms, curves, uh, retouching, selective dodging and burning, all those kinds of things that we're going to work on uh, built into the application, which is great. It does have extensive metadata support. We'll talk about what metadata is in just a second. And it's really good at organizing into albums or events, facial recognition, those kinds of things, um, which is certainly something that's more and more common these days. Uh, it's Mac only, so you have to be in that ecosystem for, for it to be really useful. Professional options, there's kind of really two out there, both made by Adobe. Uh, the first one is Adobe's Lightroom. Um, Lightroom is the high-end product here. Um, it's, it's part of, I think if you subscribe to the uh, CS, or so what is it, um, Creative Cloud, the Adobe Creative Cloud in the photo subscription. It includes something called Lightroom. This is a management application that deals with how do you store and process your images. It has a great workflow built into it. It's a really, really good application, and it's definitely on the professional side. So if you have lots and lots of images, this is a great option uh, for you. It has all the same stuff. The problem is that it's expensive because you have a monthly subscription to it, non-destructive -destru editing of images. It's very advanced. It has almost everything that Photoshop has in it um, already built into it, so it makes it really easy to work through your images. Extensive metadata support, great at organizing uh, your photos, albums, etc. The other option is what we're going to do today, which is definitely in the professional side of things, and it's Photoshop itself. And so Photoshop itself is probably the gold standard, the highest bar in terms of what you can do with photo editing, right? You can edit individual pixels in Photoshop. It's very, very good at what it does. It's very well established. It is also very expensive, but the good news is it's here for you to use for free on the lab computers because we're paying for it, right? You may also have a subscription or you may decide to have a subscription uh, which allow you to have access to it as well. It used to be more expensive because you'd buy it once and it would be like four or $500, and now you can subscribe to it when you want to and that sort of thing. So in a way, it's cheaper, but in a way, long term, it would be more expensive. So I don't, I don't know what's the right, right way of saying. It does have the most advanced editing features of any options that are out there, which is a good thing. It does not, however, do kind of album storage. So you can't organize your photos in any way. It's just an editor. So you still have to figure out some way of organizing or storing your photos or putting them on backup drives or, or that sort of thing. It is all about editing the individual image. And that's what we're going to spend time working on. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about organizing your images. Um, with every photo that you take, there's certain information that is stored in a particular photo. And so it's something called metadata. Right? And this is stuff that you can't see. Uh, anybody remember back to, like, did you have a great aunt or something who used to take pictures, and when she printed out the pictures, it had a little date stamped in the corner? Do you guys kind of vaguely remember that? Or it was kind of old school, like, hey, the picture was taken on such and such a date, and it was burned in kind of orange in the bottom corner. Okay? Metadata is essentially that on steroids, but it's contained invis invisible, invisibly. 
Sometimes you get hung up on words, right? It's invisible within the file. So you can't actually see the date, but it's all there, okay? So if we were looking at this, right, this particular image that I shot, it tells us right here that it was shot with a Nikon D80. It also contains what the lens was, right, that I shot it with. It contains all the information about the particular, right, settings on the camera. So there it is. It was an ISO of 125. This is all stuff we talked about last class, right? It was a 62 millimeter lens. It had an exposure value of zero, uh, an aperture of 5.6, and it was 1 500th of a second. So all that information from the camera is stored within the file itself. Okay? But more important than that is other information, like the date that it was shot, right? the size of the image, those kinds of things, obviously stored. If you have uh, or you shot uh, the image with your phone, Right? Chances are it's going to include a GPS location as part of your metadata. So where this image was taken. Right? You guys remember when you first opened up your phone, it popped up something like, would you like to allow iOS to use your location when it's, or the camera app to use your location or something like that? And you probably said, yeah, yeah, whatever. Right? Well, that is effectively saying, yes, go ahead and tag my image with the location that I shot it in. Okay. So it's associating that information. It's all metadata. So organizing folders, albums, places, right? These are various strategies for how do you organize your photos and access your photos um, in some way that they're accessible and easy to find, OK? So let's talk about what some of those mean. Folders are kind of the ba most basic form of organization. I took photos in Rome. I put them in a Rome folder on my computer. Right? They're all in one place. It's a folder. It's relatively simple. It seems self-explanatory. Okay? If we move forward into albums, generally albums are part of some kind of a software package that helps you organize your, your photos, whether it's uh, photos on OS X um, or uh, Lightroom, some way of organizing into albums. There are such things as smart albums that help you organize your, your images. Show me all the images that were shot in this specific location. And it looks at the geolocation tag from your phone and groups them all together. Show me all the images that I rated five stars or higher, right? something like that. So it's a way of collecting photos based on metadata. Show me all the pictures that I shot with my iPhone. Show me all the pictures that I saw with my Nikon, whatever, those kinds of things. Okay? So those are smart albums. But it's still, it's a little bit rudimentary. Okay? The next thing is that the big photo companies realize that when we take photos, we tend to take groups of photos. And those groups tend to correspond to an event. Okay? It's unlikely that you take one photo every hour indefinitely. Right? There's a pretty good chance you went to a birthday party, you took 25 photos, 50 photos, and then you don't take any photos for the next day. And then maybe you go to school, and I give you the assignment, and you go take 50 photos. Right? There's breaks in between these little capture moments. Okay? When this happens, the computer programs are sophisticated enough to realize that, hey, chances are this group of 50 photos goes together. Chances are you shot all these photos at a birthday party, therefore it's event. So it tends to group these as events, which is a really nice strategy because it's looking at your use habits and then trying to organize based on those use habits. Um, you can specify that events can occur over the course of a day, could occur over the course of an hour, et cetera. There's, there's fine tuning, but generally it's pretty good at sorting these things out. So faces, this is one of the very interesting things that has been shockingly show, slow to catch on or sho shockingly slow for people to understand. Uh, so anybody here use Snapchat? If nobody raises their hand, I'm shocked, right? <laughs> OK. So I'm, I cannot profess to be an expert in Snapchat. I think I'm slightly old for the Snapchat era. Okay? But I am aware of it, certainly. And I will admit to my wife and my daughter find it extraordinarily amusing to make themselves little deer or whatever. Anyway, so you guys notice in Snapchat, right, that in this particular application, you touch on a face and it like applies little deer ears or whatever to it, right? You guys have seen this happen, okay? If you move your face, does the stuff move with you? Yeah, you stick out your tongue and the dog tongue comes out, right, all that kind of stuff. This is essentially facial recognition software. So it recognizes what your face is, where your eyes are, where your nose is, where your tongue is, right? And it's 
poking fun at it because it's obviously, you know, the gummy worm comes out of your nose or the, the, the dog, you know, you get the idea, right? It does fun stuff with it, but the technology is there such that inside a photo, the computer can recognize people, okay? So it can not only recognize people, but it can differentiate between you and me, for example, okay? So these programs can use facial recognition to say, show me all the pictures of me. Right? Show me all the pictures of you know, my wife. And it will do that as part of the organization strategy, which is really awesome if it's pictures of you and your wife and your kids and that sort of thing in your organizing. If you start to think about the larger implications of what photo recognition means and the fact that a company like Facebook, who lots of people post pictures to, could very easily sort through and figure out who every individual was and what their use habits were, it can get on the creepy side. Okay? But the point is that this, this software definitely exists and is out there and is readily available to companies. So you want to be aware of that. Okay? But we might as well use it. Places we already talked about, it's the idea that GPS in your camera marks where you took the photo, which is great. Right? You can go back and see all the photos that you took in Rome because they're all GPS tagged. So let's start to talk about the typical adjustments that are part of this post-processing workflow. Okay? So the first thing is cropping or resizing your images, right? This is, this is very common. We talked a lot about compositional techniques last class. Certainly the rule of thirds, I emphasize that. Sometimes you take a photo and you kind of think of it as, oh, this is rule of thirds, uh, it's about right. But after the fact, you look at the photo and you say, ah, it needs a little tweaking, or I really want it to be a little bit smaller. I want to adjust it, right? Well, typically in one of these post-processing applications, certainly Photoshop, we get something like this that gives us the rule of thirds grid, right? Where we suddenly have the lines of the rule of thirds and it's easy to say to tweak it, right? Remember that you can only crop an image to get smaller, you can't crop an image to get bigger. I know that seems really obvious, right? But this is important when you're shooting. If you think you're gonna crop the image down, right? Shoot in high quality, shoot bigger than you need, and then crop down because you can't get back what you already cropped out. Okay? So you end up with the final version uh, based on the rule of thirds. Right? Here's a couple other examples in Photoshop. Right? In this example, uh, and again, these are classic rule of thirds. Right? There we go, there's the rule of thirds. The lady stands nicely there. This transition right there is nicely rule of thirds. Right? Square composition. Right, we've been doing lots of rectangles. This still falls really nicely on the rule of thirds. There's that rule of thirds line. The eyes, roughly right about there, which is about a third. Right? Recognize also that the girl and the dog are both looking this direction, which gives us this extra space. Right? We wouldn't want the, the, the image to be cropped over here with them looking off the page. Right? If it was here instead, here, let me clear this. All right, if our image was like this, and we had this as our extra space, that wouldn't look right, right? So remember, it's about which direction they're looking as part of this crop. Another example, I just love this picture. Like this, to me, this is like the perfect place to work. <laughs> like I would just love it. I might not get any work done, but, <laughs> but such is life, you know? But here we go. Uh, once again, there's our nice rule of thirds. Boom, the person is there. There's that rule of thirds really nicely, right? And we get that as part of it. And again, he's looking off, so our extra space is showing up right there. That's critical. So exposure. Exposure is great, especially if we're using raw format files. Okay? Because a raw format is going to capture more than what we're seeing in the image, and it's going to allow us to make some adjustments. Right? Every once in a while, you go out and you shoot a picture, and it's just like too bright, and everything's too white. Anybody had that happen before? Right? Or you go out and you shoot a picture, and it's really dark, and you're like, oh, I can't really see anything. Okay? Well, the nice thing, especially if we shoot in raw, is that we can adjust the exposure to be more correct. Right? The camera metering was a little off, we didn't get a good result. We can come back and we can adjust that slider and make the exposure better right? to our eye, what looks good. Remember, it's very easy to lighten dark images. It's much harder to darken light images and get the detail back. Okay? So let's look at an example here. The image on the left 
is too dark, right? The exposure is off. The image on the right has the correct exposure. So we've brightened it up a little bit. Okay. Brightness and contrast are another typical uh, adjustment that are out there. To me, they're a little bit heavy-handed. It's just, it, it, yes, you can make adjustments, but there are finer, more detailed ways of doing it that will give you better results. So this is kind of a, a broad stroke approach. It's trying to paint your image instead of with a nice detail brush with a big old you know, four inch paintbrush or something. You know, it's just it's too much. Okay? But it does adjust the overall brightness of the image and you can go from the image on the left to the image on the right, which certainly looks a little bit better. The point is though, there are slightly better techniques for that. Color and saturation. Remember we talked about what white balance was last class when you have the image that's too blue or the image that's too orange. This color and saturation adjustment will allow us to shift the image colors to be one direction or the other, right? You could also go in and specifically tint an image to be a specific color, right? You want something in the image to be a color, you can, you can shift it in that direction. Maybe you want to convert into black and white or a sepia tone. Sepia is just a brownish black and white. It's meant to mimic kind of the old school photos that aren't true black and whites, but are kind of that brownish tint. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so you can take that original image and you can make it into black and white. This is something that we're going to do uh, in Photoshop today, and I'm going to teach you how to do. It is very important that you not take your camera and say, make black and white image on your camera. Okay, because what it does is it strips out two of the color channels. It gives you only a third of the data that's actually in the picture. You get a much smaller image, much worse quality, right? The way I'll show you how to do it today in Photoshop will give you a much higher quality image with some much finer adjustments uh, to how that black and white image uh, shows up. So there's an example of black and white. Focus. Okay. This can really make the edges stand out or the little bit of contrast stand out in your final image. Okay. The problem here is that people often think, wait a minute, I went out and I shot something, it was a little blurry, let me come back and I'll just adjust the focus or I'll adjust the sharpening and it'll make it nice and clear again. Okay? This isn't designed for that purpose. This is designed for small detail, not I have a blurry image and I want to make it uh, sharp. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So we have something like this on the left and again this shows you how subtle it is. Right? On the left is without the, um, without the uh, sharpening, on the right here uh, we've got the sharpening. And so what you have to do is you look really closely at the edges here of these pages, right? And then look at the edges right here in contrast. And you can see a lot more detail in this one than you can in the first one, right? Because it's small contrast. It's sharpened those edges just a little bit. You guys see the difference? Okay. If you can't see it as well on the projector, you can certainly look at it after the fact in the slides, and it's a little bit more obvious. So it's very small detail. What, what's actually, it's adjusting what's called micro contrast. It's really tiny contrast between pixels. Red eye reduction. Anybody have this happen before to them in a photo? Okay. Does anybody know why it happens? Nobody? All right, so this is fun, right? We get to talk about fun biological stuff. This is not my area of expertise here, but let's see if I can get a, a blank piece of paper to draw on. No. How about we'll draw on graph paper? All right, sweet. OK, so let's say I'm sitting over here and I have my camera with my little lens, right? And let's see here. Here, I'm standing right here shooting my picture, OK? And on my camera, there's a little flash, right, that's, that's going to flash when it's dark, OK? Now, when it's dark and you're standing over here, here's your eyeball, right? And let's see, you can have some little eyelashes. Some other little eyelashes there. Okay, when you're here and you're standing in the dark, okay, what happens to the pupil of your eye? It gets really big, right? It dilates, it gets really big. That's normal. Okay, so I'm over here and I take a picture. Boom, and I flash. My light goes right out like this. Boop, goes into that really large pupil, right? And guess what? The back of your eye here reflects the light and it comes back out. Camera captures it. That's red eye. Okay? So it's a reflection of the flash on the back of your eye as it comes back out. Okay? Kind of weird. Okay? So you guys have seen like red eye reduction flashes okay? on your camera. You turn that on and it like flashes a couple times first and then takes the picture. Right? 
what does that flash do to your eye? Constricts your pupil, makes it smaller. Okay? With your pupil smaller, it's much harder to get that reflection back out. So therefore, you have red eye reduction. Okay? The other option to this would certainly be, I wonder how I get back. No. No. There we go. We're going to go back. The other option would be certainly go ahead and take it with red eye and just post process it out later. Right? Photoshop, we can drop in. We can do a little clone stamp. We can make that red eye go right away. Okay? But here it is. Here's the example. There's that reflection of the flash off the back of your eyes. Right? So this is something that can be done in post-processing. It's something that can be done um, live. Right? When you have the camera, you can flash first and then take the picture. All right. Levels adjustment. I told you guys earlier in this lecture that levels adjustment was my thing. It was the thing that I always had to do to my images. Okay? Levels adjustment is all about adjusting for a true black in your image and a true white in your image. Okay? And it's hard to kind of do this because I want to flip forward to the image and then I'll come back to it. Uh, but we're going to talk about this graph, which is called the histogram, and what it means in just a second. So let me go forward to the actual image. So we have the image over here on the left. That's the original. The image on the right is the post-processed version. The image on the right looks a lot better than the original, wouldn't you say? Okay. So what I've done is I've said, OK, in the original image, so in here, what is true black? Right? Or what should be true black? Right? Well, chances are it's going to be a point that's like right in here in that little black shadow, something like that. So that's true black. So I've, ident I've identified that. And then I want to say, OK, well, what point is true white in this original image? Well, it might be maybe this piece of peeling paint there. right? It might be that piece right there. It might be a little bit on the, uh, the, the uh, you know, concrete texture. right? So I've identified what true black is and what true white is. And I'm going to correct those such that the black is actually black. The white, I was saying the white was, this is probably the best one. The white is really white. Okay? So let's go back and let's take a quick look at that histogram again. Because this graph right here represents my image. Okay? And so what this does is it represents the distribution of pixels in various shades of gray. So if I were to pretend that image that I just saw was in black and white, right? I'd have a bunch of pixels that represented true black, and they'd end up right here on the graph. I don't have very many, so it's really small as we're going this direction. If I look at what is a medium gray, say maybe 50% gray, that's going to be right here. And you see that the graph goes way up. That's because I have lots of pixels that are that medium gray color. And then we come out here, and this is white, right? and I don't have any pixels. The graph ends back here. So I have nothing that's true white. So what I do in a levels adjustment is I pull the white value back. Oops, sorry, wrong brush here. I pull the white value back right there from here back to there. <laughs> Likewise, I pull the black value over to right here, right where the graph starts to go up and where it comes down. Right? So I'm adjusting the white point and the black point. Okay? There is a graph, there is an adjustment for the middle, which is the gray value. Right? And again, all of this is hard to kind of explain when you're talking about it in lecture format. When we do a live example in you know, a half hour and we're working on Photoshop, it'll be completely obvious as to what happens. Okay? So bear with me as we go through this thing. So the next thing is curves adjustments. And curves adjustments really allow you to selectively adjust certain parts of an image without changing other parts of the image. And to me, trying to verbally describe what a curves adjustment is is virtually impossible. Um, you just have to kind of do it. And so I'll walk you through how to do it. But it takes an image that's on the left and makes it look like the image that's on the right. Okay? Likewise here, we have the first image followed by the second image. You can tell there's a difference between those two. This is the curves adjustment panel in Photoshop, and that's what they've done to it. Okay, so you can see the transition between first image, second image, done by the curves. It's a big adjustment. Okay? So we'll talk about that, and we'll do it live, and it'll make more sense. Final results, printing, exporting, et cetera. 
Uh, you want to think about what's your intended outcome for this image. Do you want it to go be printed somewhere? How big is it going to be? Right? Do you want to just post it to Instagram or Facebook or whatever, in which case the size doesn't matter so much? Right? But you will have done the post-processing to make the image better, and then you do the output, whatever the final output is. Okay? There's a bunch of web galleries. You guys are all familiar with these things. I mean, basically now it's Facebook or Instagram, right, for the most part. All right. So let's move into, what do we have for timing here? Yeah. Let's move into the demonstration part. Uh, and then we'll take a break after the demonstration part. Um, so you guys have two handouts. Actually, let me, um, let me stop recording here and we'll switch computers. So bear with me for just a second. OK, so sorry, sorry I had to switch computers here for a second. Uh, you got two handouts today. Uh, the first one is exercise 104, which is what we're going to do and what I'm going to demonstrate uh, for you. Uh, the second one is your first assignment for the class, assignment 101, which is simply your best photograph. And so the idea here is that sometime after the start of this semester, so the first day of class was 8-15, August uh, 15th, sometime after August 15th, you need to have taken a picture, you need to do post-processing to it to make it look good, okay? When I say post-processing, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything that I'm going to teach you how to do. You just have to do something that I'm going to teach you how to do to make your image look good. Right? All I care about is that the image looks really good at the end, not about which pieces you chose to do. Um, and you're going to post this to the course website, and you're going to give me one 8.5 by 11 print of your image on the school printer. So it's more for my records. You will not get that print back, but that way I have a record of, of what you guys did. Okay? It, you can just print it here to the C5550, and it costs like 25 cents. Okay? And that way I have a, a record of it. So um, you're going to post it to the website. It is due before the start of class one week from today. Right? So you have this weekend to work on it, to take a picture. If you don't like your pictures, to do your post-processing. We'll talk about a few more advanced techniques on Monday that you can maybe or maybe not elect to use. And you'll turn it in by Wednesday. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Nice and clear. Remember, it's due prior to the start of class. So it has to be posted before class starts. Okay? I'll be honest, I don't really care whether you've handed me the printed version before class starts. If you just give it to me that day, I'm fine. But the, the post online has to happen before class starts. Okay? Just, I'm not trying to beat you over the heads, but I want to be very clear that that's the requirement. Okay? okay, so you have your assignment 101. You can read the details on that. But today we're going to introduce Photoshop and we're going to talk about basic post-processing techniques. Um, so I've already logged into the computer. I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, Adobe Photoshop. So I'll go to the Start menu. I'll go to All Apps here. And I'm going to look for Adobe Design Standard CS6, which is under the A's. And from there, I'm going to choose Adobe Photoshop CS6. Okay, And that's going to go ahead and open up uh, Photoshop. We are currently using CS6 on the lab computers. If you have a subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud um, and you're, you're working on your, your laptop computer at home or whatever, in the world of Photoshop, you really don't have to worry too much. The files should be cross-compatible whether you work on the lab computer or whether you work on your home computer. I will warn you right now that when we get to InDesign and Illustrator, it's much harder to go back and forth between the two. So just be aware of that. We'll talk about how you do it uh, a little bit later on. But for now, we're going to work in Photoshop CS6 and go through a variety of steps um, talking kind of how, how to do post-processing. But before I get started with the actual images, I like to try to introduce what's happening in the world of Photoshop on the screen. Where are certain things? How do we access certain commands, et cetera? So across the top, um, of the Photoshop window here, we have our basic menu structure, you know, file, edit, etc. A lot of the things that we're going to be doing will center on the layer menu. Um, it's just something to be aware of. But again, a lot of things will deal with other panels. But you can come up here and access certain tools and certain commands. Uh, I will reference those in, in the various tutorials uh, as we go forward. Okay? Below this set of menus is something called a ribbon that runs across the top of the page. Okay? This contains information relevant to whatever tool is currently selected. Okay? So right now I have, by default, the rectangular marquee tool selected. Therefore, I get rectangular marquee options. Okay? If I were to switch, say, to the paintbrush tool, 
right? I'm going to get tools related to the brush at the ribbon at the top. Okay? If I switch to the pen tool, I'll get information about the pen tool. So you see that that ribbon is always changing, right? And this is very common in the Adobe products line. Okay? So on the left hand side here, I have a basic set of tools, right, that will allow me to access certain things. Uh, we're going to be dealing a lot uh, with a few of the tools and not so much with some of the other tools. Um, in this class, recognize, of course, that you could take a class for the entire semester based on Photoshop. We don't get the luxury of spending the whole semester working in Photoshop because we have to cover so much. So I'm going to try to teach you what I consider to be the most important things that you learn in Photoshop. Right? So it's compressed into this is the most important stuff. Therefore, there's going to be a lot of things that are left out. Right? Um, so that's just kind of the nature of it. But again, I'll try to, try to give you the, what I think are the most important things. Okay? If we move over to the right side of the page, at the very top is a little drop down menu that has to do with the workspace that you're currently working in. And this is um, very similar whether you're in um, InDesign, Illustrator, or in Photoshop. And what this allows you to do is quickly change from what they call essentials into something specific. If I was doing painting, for example, I could select painting, and my toolbars are going to change. My palettes are going to change. You see that this looks a lot more like painting. I have brushes available, et cetera. Okay? If I switch to photography, for example, a lot of my uh, adjustments are going to change here as well. For what we're doing today, it doesn't matter whether you're in essentials mode or whether you're in photography mode. I'm going to stick in essentials so it's the most basic setup as you start to get used to it. Okay? But you could long term end up in photography mode uh, because it gives you different access to certain tools. Okay? Um, the, the one thing of note here is that at the bottom of this set of panels is always your layers and your layer stack. Once we start creating some images, you'll start to see things showing up here in the layers, and I'll reference those a little bit later as we go along. Okay? So I'm going to start with the first uh, kind of basic level adjustment, which is to convert something to black and white. Um, I'm going to follow a series of tutorials that are available online. Uh, the website is back up. So if I go to digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, and I should have already logged in. I apologize. You have to bear with me. At least it was back up this morning. <laughs> it should be up. Oh, come on. There we go. You would think I could remember my password, right? Might be asking too much. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Tutorials. I'm going to go to Photoshop. And we're going to start with Photoshop 1.1. It's the first one that we'll do. And a lot of times it's useful to just kind of have this um, sitting in the background just in case you need it as you go through this. You'll see that on the Exercise 104 handout here, uh, under Part 1, um, I'm going to, in the second step, I say follow Photoshop 1.1, black and white, right? So it's a direct reference to something that I've written out step by step. I have tried in these, in these tutorials to have uh, lots of information for you. So there is step by step exactly what I'm going to go through here with little images. Okay? Likewise, there's a downloadable um, piece at the bottom if you need it. And at the top here right, is actually a video that will do exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? So if you get lost or you go back to try to do it and you can't remember how I did it, it's all here and available for you. Okay, So we're going to start. And it does say open Photoshop CS3. We're obviously in CS6, so open CS6. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and um, start here. And the first thing that I need to do is go to File and then Open so that I can pick an image to begin with. OK? So let me, uh, let's see here. I need to get into my, into 104 here. And let's see here.
trying to pick an image. All right, I'm going to start with this one. From yours, right? So you'll pick an image that's, that's from your collection, from the ones that you sought in exercise 103. Um, I'm going to open up a variety of images here because sometimes uh, what I show you is easier to see in one version versus another. Um, so let's open this one too. Um, sometimes things are more obvious in, in various images. When you're going through and doing the steps, sometimes you'll see something really obvious in your, when, I, when I ask you to do something. Sometimes you won't see it as much. Uh, and that's going to vary a little bit based on the image. So if something doesn't really work, just go through it anyway uh, as part of the process. OK, so I'm going to start with this image as my first image here. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this image to black and white. And what a lot of people who don't know Photoshop very well do is they run up to the image menu and they go to mode and they say uh, grayscale. Right? And you see that it brings up this message that says, are you sure you want to discard the color information? Right? This is not something that's a reversible process. Right? Bad idea here. Right? You're also stripping down a lot of the information that's in the image. So instead of doing that, we're going to go to uh, layer, new adjustment layer right here, and we're going to choose something called the channel mixer, which is the right down here. Okay? So it's layer, new adjustment layer, channel mixer. Okay? And it'll ask for a name of this layer. I'm going to call it black and white. Um, it is always useful when you're working in Photoshop to name your layers because you'll end up with a bunch of layers, and if you don't know what's on what layer, it starts to get really confusing. Right, so we're going to go ahead and name it something obvious like black and white. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And when I do that, uh, I get over here in my layers right, a layer that's called black and white, which is exactly what I wanted to show up. And below it, I have what's called my background layer, which is my original image. So my edits are occurring on a layer that is not the original image. So we talked about non-destructive editing. This is a perfect example of non-destructive editing. Okay. Also, when I open it up, or when I created that new adjustment layer, it brings up something called properties here for the channel mixer. And I'm looking at this little window here. Okay? So in here, I have some options. The thing that I'm going to do is come down to where it says monochrome, and I'm going to check that box. And notice that when I check that box, my image turns to black and white, but I don't get a little pop-up saying, are you sure you want to discard color information? Right? So this is a reversible step. So the other thing that I have the ability to do is I can choose from a variety of presets. So you see right up here, there's a, there's a, there's a little word for, for preset and a little drop down menu. Right now it's set for custom, but there's a variety of presets that have been arranged by Photoshop that mimic if you were out in the field, you're a professional photographer, and you had a specific colored lens that you put on the camera to shoot a better quality black and white image. Okay? So if they're called filters. So let's try first the black and white with the blue filter. Okay? Well, you see when I have the blue filter, it changed pretty dramatically. The sky turned almost white, right? and everything in the, the ground here got much darker. Okay? Let's try the green filter. Okay? So it changed once again, and I got different results. Let's try the black and white with the orange filter. Again, different results. So these are all black and white versions, but they're all very, very different from each other. Okay? So you want to go through, and there isn't a right answer to this. You want to go through each of the options and decide which of these options look the best. Okay? So it's just visual. You know? I think I like that one because I see a little bit more in the sky. It has about the right. So I'm, I'm choosing to use the yellow filter right? because visually it looks the best to me. If a different color looks better to you, then you stick with that color. Okay? So when I'm done, this, chan this has been applied to my image. There's a little double arrow to the right. I can go ahead and, and close that, and I can move on. If I want to go back and adjust it again, you see this little three triangle or three circle thing? I can double click it. It'll bring back up the channel mixer. You see that all the settings that I've done are exactly the same, and I could make an adjustment. So this is not a permanent change. It's a temporary one. Okay. I can also, right here in the Layers palette, I can turn off the black and white layer, and it goes back to color. And I can turn it back on. Right? So again, temporary change, non-destructive edit. 
Okay? So I've now done the black and white, which is essentially following along with the stuff that I've talked about here. Right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next one, which is Photoshop 1.2, or Levels. So again, same thing. There's a little video that walks through it. And then here's the, the pictures. I'm going to go ahead and do it live for you as well. OK, so let's turn off for right now the black and white so we're back in the color version. Okay, I'm going to go up to my Layer menu once again. And I'm going to go to New Adjustment Layer. And this time, I'm going to choose Levels. Okay, When I click on the Levels Adjustment, it's going to give me the ability to name it. Calling it Levels is just fine. Okay, I'll go ahead and say OK. And now, instead of the channel mixer that pops up here, I have something called Levels that's popped up. Okay? And when I look at this, remember I showed you that histogram. right? Uh, in this case, my white goes all the way to the edge. So I don't need to make any adjustment on the white because I have true white. It's right here in the cloud. Okay? Likewise, I'm pretty close to true black because I have some really dark blacks in here. I can, however, drag this little triangle. And you can see that it makes the image a little bit darker and kind of pops it out a little bit. I like it right about there. Okay? Hard for you guys to see this as much. Let me go to this image, and let's see if the levels come up a little bit better on this one. So let me go to my layer, new adjustment layer, levels. And say, OK. Um, well, this is still not a good image. Let me see if I can find a better image. Hold on a second. Let me try this one here. Let's get rid of these. Okay, so I'm back to this one. I think this one, the levels will be a little bit more obvious. Let me go to image, uh, um, excuse me, layer, new adjustment layer, levels. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So again, depending on the image, you see each time that I do this that the histogram changes. So it may or may not be relevant for your particular image. So in this case, we look at the image and it's a little bit washed out. We look at the histogram and yes, the black starts way over here before it starts going up. Right? The white's pretty good. We've got kind of true white right here where the sun is. So there's not much adjustment there. But with the black, I'm going to come over here to this little triangle. And I'm going to drag that triangle over to where it starts to go up in the graph. And you can see very quickly that we take the washed out image and we add a lot more punch to it because we've adjusted that black. Okay? So in this case, I've only adjusted the black. Because the white's already there, I could adjust it back a little bit, but there's not too much that it's going to change. In this example here, I would adjust the white back, so about there. And that makes that a little bit better. And in this example here, I already pulled the black over. Okay? So we're making those adjustments to that particular graph. I need to find an image that shows this a little bit better. OK, so that one's done. I'm going to move on to the next one, which is curves. OK, so let me use this image for now. And I'm going to go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and Curves. And I told you Curves was kind of the most difficult to understand. OK, and it's going to take some experimentation on your part to kind of see how this works. But the way that Curves works is Curves, the, the graph looks a little bit different. We still have our histogram that looks very much like the histogram in the levels. But this time, we have a diagonal line that runs up. Okay. This is going from black at this lower left corner to white in the upper right corner. And as we adjust this curve, right, we can selectively lighten or darken the image. So on its most basic level, if I were to take the curve and drag it up, the whole image gets lighter. And drag it down, the whole image gets darker. Okay. So you can see that as I do that, it certainly makes the sky look better. right? But I lose a lot of information in the kind of down below in the, the sand. Right? Likewise here, I get a lot of information about what it looks like in the sand, but I lose the sky. 
Okay? So instead of doing an adjustment to the whole image, I might selectively start to adjust the image. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll say, let's adjust the sky. Okay? I'm going to peg a point right in the center. So I'll click right in the center, just a single click, and you see it adds a dot. Then I'm going to adjust the upper half of the curve independent of the lower half of the curve. Right? So obviously I don't want it to look like it's on an alien planet. So chances are this is going to pull up slightly like that. And chances are this is going to pull down slightly like that. And so what I've done is I've gone from this image to something with a little bit more, and it looks better on, on my screen, something with a little more punch in the sky and a little bit more detail down below because I've selectively lightened and darkened portions of the image. This is called the typical S curve. So you've taken a straight uh, curve and you've added a little bit of a bend to it and it improves it. Okay, let's go to a different image. Let's go to this one. Let me go to layer, new adjustment layer, curves. And let's take a look at this curve. Okay, so again, if I were in the center, I could lighten the whole image or I could darken the whole image. Okay, so let's go back and put that back in the center. Let's make a point right up here. And we can see that that's darkening, doesn't look as good. Let's punch out those colors just a little bit. We'll go up, pull this one down a little bit. And we have a typical S curve. So it's a subtle adjustment, but it's a noticeable one. Okay? So there was the original, there's the original, and there's the adjusted. Right? So again, on the screen, it's always a little harder. Hopefully, when you guys are doing it, you can see it happen a little bit easier uh, on your screens rather than the projector. OK, so once again, on this first image, let me go ahead and go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and let's do a Curves. Once again, I'll peg the center, and then I'm going to adjust the top out a little bit and the bottom down a little bit, like so. All right, And to me, that looks pretty good, subtle, but nice. Okay, So I've now made that adjustment. Okay, so we've made it through curves. The next one is something called pop. Okay, And so this one is really good for images that have lots of blues or lots of reds in them, so sunsets, uh, beaches, those kinds of things. A lot of vibrant color. So this one's a good candidate for it. I also had one, uh, let me go ahead and see if I can open another one here. This one is probably a good candidate for it. Right, to, to punch out the colors a little bit. OK, so to do this, we're going to go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and we're going to choose, once again, the Channel Mixer Adjustment. So this is the same one we used for black and white. But this time, we're not going to adjust it for black and white. We're going to adjust the values of the colors. So I have the Channel Mixer up here. And actually, I'm going to rename this to be Pop. I should have done that first so that it's obvious. And then I'm going to do a few things. So the first thing is I'm going to make sure my output channel is set to red. And then I'm going to increase the saturation of the red to 118. Okay? I'm going to compensate for increasing the saturation of the red to 118 by decreasing the green and the blue by half of what I increased. So I'm going to go to minus 9, hold on one second, and minus 9. Okay? So I've increased the saturation of red and decreased the saturation of green and blue to compensate. I always want the total of these values to equal 100. Okay, You had a question. Uh, how do you rename it? If you double click on the text, uh, it'll let you rename it. Thank you for stopping me. Sometimes I do stuff and I don't remember to tell you. Okay, So the next thing that I'll do is I'll go from my output channel of red to my output channel of green. And I'm going to switch here and do the same thing. But the green value is going to go to 118. And the red value is going to go to minus 9. And the blue value is going to go to minus 9. Okay. Then once again, I'll switch from red and green to the final one, which is blue. I'll increase the blue value to 118. And I'll do the red at minus 9 and the green at minus 9. Now, these are arbitrary values. It's not something that um, you know, there's a right or a wrong answer. You could do 20 minus 10 and minus 10. You could do 16 minus 8 minus 8. 
right? It just depends on what looks right in your particular image. So this is a subtle adjustment that you've made. It's probably very difficult for you to see it on the screen. You can see a little bit of a change in the red of the sunset. If you look at it on your computer screen, it's a much more significant change. Okay? It really beefs up the colors. It just adds a little bit more to the image. So if I went back to, say, this image, again, lots of color here. I go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Channel Mixer. We'll call this Pop. I'll say OK. And we can start with the red channel. And we'll say 118, minus 9, minus 9. Switch to the green channel. Oops. 118, minus 9, and minus 9. And then we'll switch to the blue channel. 118, minus 9, and minus 9. There we go. So now we can see that that just boosts the colors a little bit more. Right? And you can kind of see overall the colors change. And I get a little bit more uh, to them. This one, probably not a lot's going to happen when I do it. But let's go ahead and try it anyway. Uh, I'm asking you to do three images and go through all these steps. Some of the images, you'll do the step and it won't make much difference. Right? But again, it's about the process. It's about practicing. Okay? So let's do this one. I'm going to go to New Adjustment Layer. We'll go to my channel mixer. Call this pop. I'll say OK. And we'll start with the red channel. And let's do the blue channel. All right. So in this particular case, it's very, very subtle. Uh, you guys on the screen, I, I'm sure you can't even see it. I can see it on, on this screen just a little bit. Okay? But again, it's not oversaturated. It doesn't have lots of reds and stuff, so you're not going to see too much out of it. Okay? So I've now done pop. Okay? The next one that we're going to do is a little bit different. And this is called dodge and burn. Okay? And so this is a holdover to the old days where you used to go in a, a dark room and develop film. And depending on which chemicals and how you washed the, the sheet that you were developing in certain chemicals, you could selectively lighten and or darken parts of the image, right? depending on what you wanted. So Photoshop, you can do this digitally. And the good news is you don't have to mix any chemicals. And you also don't screw things up. You can go backwards. Um, so we're going to follow this tutorial now, which is a little bit different than the things that we've been doing. Okay? So everything else was an adjustment layer. This is going to be just a basic layer. So I'm going to Layer, New Layer. Okay? And I'll call this layer Dodge and Burn. Okay? But I'm going to do something different. Down here, it's going to say Mode. I'm going to change the mode to be Overlay. Okay, this is the layer mode is in overlay. And then I'm going to check the box below it that says fill with a neutral, overlay neutral 50% gray. Okay, so it's a little bit different than we've been doing. And I'll say OK. Okay, so once again, that was under layer, new layer. Call it dodge and burn. Change the mode to overlay and check the box for fill with a 50% gray. Okay, and again, if you get lost, Remember, it's written out right here. There's little boxes that tell you where this stuff is and what to select. Okay. All right. So I've done that. I want to make sure that the dodge and burn layer is the current layer. So see how it's highlighted in kind of that bluish color? That means it's the current layer. And then I'm going to come over here on my left, and I'm going to choose. It looks like a circle with a little line sticking out of it. That is the dodge tool. If I click and hold on it, I can choose the burn tool, which is kind of a little hand. Okay, So again, it's, it's like a pin almost, is the dodge tool. I'm going to choose the burn tool, which is the hand. And when I choose the burn tool, I'm going to look up here at the top of the page. And remember, the ribbon across the top gives me options for my specific tool. Okay, So first thing is I have a brush size. So let me go ahead and, and if I click the little triangle, I can make the brush a little bit bigger. I'm going to make it maybe 
you know, about now a little bigger than that. A little bit more. Yeah, maybe about like that. Maybe about 400 pixels or so. Okay, like that. I do want the hardness to be set all the way to the left, so it's a very soft brush. Okay, and when I'm done making those settings, I'll click the little triangle, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over pieces of the image that I want to be a little bit darker. And so typically you might do a little bit like up in the sky here, maybe a little bit over in there. And let me darken up this piece because I've got a little bit in there. Let's just darken that up a little bit so that the whole shadow is a little darker. And let's darken this a little bit like that. Okay. So if we were to turn it on and turn it off, you can see that's what it was before. That's what it is after. right? I could make my brush a little bit bigger. By the way, you can use the bracket keys to make the brush bigger or smaller. Right? Uh, so I could, I could bump the size of my brush up even a little bit bigger and kind of selectively darken a little bit more of the image there and like that. Okay? Now maybe I went a little too far and I'm unhappy with what I did. Right? I can switch from the burn tool back to the dodge tool, which selectively lightens. Right? And I could go in and I could selectively lighten parts of the image. So let me make the brush a little bit bigger here. Oops. And about like that. And I could come back in and I could selectively lighten those trees. I didn't like that I darkened those up, right? Just to so that you guys can see it, right? If I worked my way in here, I could very slowly get this back to the original lightness. And eventually, I don't know if you guys are able, there you go. You can start to see the twig showing up, right? I keep lightening and lightening and lightening, and eventually I can make that piece of the image much, much lighter. Okay? That obviously wasn't what I wanted, so I'm gonna step back. Um, and go back to where it was before. Okay, So that's dodging and burning. So I'll do it one more time, just so that you guys can see it. I'll do it in this image. I'm going to go to Layer, New Layer, Dodge and Burn. I'll say OK. And oops, that was wrong. See, even I make mistakes. Layer, New Layer. Dodge and burn. I have to make sure that the mode is set to overlay. And I have to check the box for fill with a neutral 50% gray. I'll say OK. And now I can come in here with the burn tool, make my brush smaller. And we can darken up the background just a little bit. We darken up this edge like that. Maybe like that. I could switch to the dodge tool, which is going to lighten. And maybe I could lighten up that top there just a little bit. Maybe I want to lighten up this edge just a little bit. Lighten up that edge just a little bit to make it stand out. Something like that. Okay. So again, it's, it's a subtle adjustment, but it can make a big difference in what your image looks like overall. Okay. So after you have those adjustments done, we're going to go ahead and save a bunch of versions of these files. Okay? You're, today in your exercise, you're going to create a total of 18 images. And you're going to post all those 18 images. I'm only going to do six, uh, which is a third of it. And then you guys will do it again. So you're picking three images to start. And you're going to perform all of the steps on each of those three images. Okay? So we have our original image. And then we have the five steps. So I'm going to come back to my original image here. I turned off. You see the little eye that's in front of each layer? I can turn off all the adjustments that I've made and start with just the basic image. Okay. So here's the basic image. I'm going to go up to the File menu. I'm going to go to Save for Web. I'm going to change the type of image from a, a GIF to a JPEG. Perfect. And then I'll go ahead and click on the Save button. Okay. Then I'll put it on my flash drive. Oops, sorry. And let's put it into uh, today's folder. And I'm going to create a new folder. And we'll call this Fall 2016. And then inside of that folder, I'm going to make one more new folder. And we'll call this Output, just for organization purposes. Okay. So this here is image 0287, but I'm going to add an underscore original. 
so that I know that this is the original image. There it is, original. And I'll go ahead and click Save. There it is. Next one, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the black and white. I'll go to File, Save for Web. Settings, Stay. I'll click Save. And this time, instead of original, I'm going to change original to be BW for black and white. I'll go ahead and click Save. Okay. I'll turn off the black and white, and I'll turn on the levels. I'll go to File, Save for Web. I'll click Save. And this time, it's not going to be black and white. It's going to be levels. And I'll click Save. Now, I don't care whether you add the layers together to make the image or whether you do them all separately. So for example, when I turn the curves on, maybe I want both the levels and the curves to be on for the curves layer. That's fine with me. I'll go to File, Save for Web. I'll click Save, and we're going to call this Curves. By the way, if you're working in the Creative Cloud, the Save for Web option disappeared. So instead of doing Save for Web, you're just going to do a Save As. Okay. So um, let's call this one Curves. I'll go ahead and click Save. Let me turn on Pop. I'll go to File, Save for Web. You guys are getting the idea, right? All right. Pop, Save. And then the last one, the Dodge and Burn is on. And I'm going to actually turn them all on for the Dodge and Burn. And I'm going to go to File, Save for Web, Save. And we'll call this uh, Dodge and Burn. And I'll click Save. So I end up with six total images of this one image, the original plus five edits. Okay. Then I'm going to go to the course website, and I'm going to create a new post. So I'll go to the little plus sign for new, and then post. And I'm going to follow the steps that are on the back of your handout today. Because we're posting so many images, I'm going to post them a little bit differently than I have before. Okay? So here I am. I'm going to create a new post. This is exercise 104. Right? And I'm going to make sure that I categorize this correctly. So we'll come down here, and we're going to look for exercise 104. There we go. All right. Uh, good, I got that. Good. Then I'm going to go to the tab called Gallery. So you see Content is the normal tab. I'm going to come over to Gallery and click on it. I'm going to click on the Insert Gallery or Add, uh, excuse me, I'm going to click on the Add Images to Gallery button. Wait, I skipped a few steps. Sorry. Let me go back. So let me go back to the content here. I'm going to check this box for gallery. Again, this is written out, so you can just follow it along. OK, so this is going to be a gallery post. Then I'm going to go and check this little toggle for slideshow on post page. Okay. Then I'll go to the gallery tab. Sorry, I was a few, few pieces ahead of me. I'm going to click on the Add Images to Gallery. And I'm then going to browse for my images. Okay, so I'll click on Select Files. I'm going to go to my live demonstrations here. And I'm going to go to Fall 2016. Here's my images. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and select all of them. So I'll drag through all of them. And I'll click on Open. And this is going to take some time. Okay, especially if you do 18 images, and especially if everybody does it at exactly the same time. Okay? So just be patient when this happens. This is the kind of thing to you know, start, and then go get a cup of coffee, and then it'll be done. Okay? So we will let this finish uploading. And you'll see that it'll go to 100%. It'll say crunching. It'll move on to the next one. And eventually, they'll all say show. That's what we're looking for. See, there it is, crunching. And then it turns to show.
So while I'm waiting for this, remember that since this is an exercise today, what the final images look like doesn't matter. So feel free to play around with them and experiment with them and decide what looks good and what doesn't look good. And, and even if the end results aren't pretty, that's OK. It's an exercise. You're going to get credit anyway. This is where you learn the process. All right, so once I've gotten all of them here, I'll go ahead and click on Save All Changes. Now, I wish the website was a little bit better at um, showing you what you got immediately. So I'll go ahead and close this. And if I go back to the Content tab, nothing's there. Okay? I actually have to publish the post for anything to happen. But before I do that, let me set a featured image. So I'll come down here, set featured image. Because I already uploaded the files, I don't have to upload it again. It'll show up right here. And I could say, you know what? I like this as my featured image. We'll set that. And it'll show up in a second. There it is. And then I'll scroll back up, and I'll go ahead and click on Publish. All right, now that it's posted, I'm going to go ahead and view the post. And when I do that, I should say, a slideshow that shows up here where I can click through all of the images that I posted. Okay, That's what we're shooting for. Uh, some of you will have enabled a gallery, whether by accident or intentionally, in which case all of the images will show up as little squares. That's OK, too. Right? But the point is that this is a way of uploading a large quantity of images at once. Okay, So this is what you need for Exercise 104. I told you last class that we were exempt from Exercise 103. You don't have to post anything for Exercise 103, nor do you need to comment on Exercise 103. So you won't be held for either of those. You will comment on this. We'll, I'll remind you to do the comments at the start of next class. Um, but that's, that's the, the process as we go forward. Okay. Remember that at 10.30, so that's in an hour, we're going to restart all the computers and let you log in. Um, I would like you to be here for that, because then we'll open up all the applications and we won't have to go through any of the startup and initializing processes anymore. Okay? That's why we assign the seats. Make sure you're actually in your assigned seat, right? and we'll go from there. Are there any questions? I know today was a lot to take in. Nope. All right. 